In this video, I present some contents of my book entitled Untangling Complex Systems, a Grand Challenge for Science. One relevant purpose of science is to solve problems and improve the psychophysical well-being of humans. Nowadays, there are a billion people on Earth. Of course, each person strives to reach their psychophysical well-being every day. But beyond personal needs, our contemporary world is different because global challenges also need to be faced. The development of transportation means and information and communication technologies has transformed humanity radically. Humans are now more linked to each other than ever before. Humanity as a whole gives rise to a vast and dynamic network on Earth. Every human belonging to this network needs to face challenges regarding the network as a whole. Such challenges are global for two reasons. First, they might regard almost everyone on Earth. Second, they might be multisectorial because they encompass humanity from different points of view, such as health, social, political, economic, cultural, and ethical. Global challenges require global agendas to be faced and won. For instance, in 2015, the United Nations compiled a comprehensive and far-reaching plan, the 2030 Agenda, that included 17 goals, assuring a general sustainable development if pursued worldwide. At the heart of the 17 goals are human beings and their societies, the world economy, the urban areas, the natural ecosystems, and all the living beings they embed, and the climate. They are complex systems, so clearly facing global challenges means dealing with complex systems. But what is a complex system? Well, there's no universally accepted formal definition. Most scholars studying complex systems would agree that a complex system is a tricky system to describe. In other words, it's tough to rationalize and predict the behavior of any complex system. This sentence is an epistemological definition of a complex system because it refers to our capability to know complex systems. In, this, uh, in my book, I propose answers to the following questions. Why do we have this epistemological definition of a complex system? Can we alternatively propose an ontological definition of a complex system? A definition is ontological if it outlines the essence of any complex system. What can we do to achieve a deeper understanding of complex systems? It's valuable to make a historical introduction to the investigation into complex systems to answer all these questions. And I will show how science moved from the investigation into simple system to complex system. As I wrote in my book, Untangling Complex Systems, A Grand Challenge for Science, humankind's journey to discovering the secrets of nature, beginning with the appearance of humans on Earth, has been characterized, in my view, by two revolutionary intellectual events so far. The first is the birth of philosophy in the ancient Greek colonies during the 6th century BC. The second, is uh, the mature formulation and application of the experimental method for inquiring about nature in the 17th century AD. These two events split up the scientific journey into three main stages. The first stage can be named practical, the practical period, because humans, spurred by their necessities, were particularly ingenious in making artifacts for solving practical problems surviving and improving their psychophysical well-being. Unconsciously, they obtained the first important achievements in developing physical technologies, which are methods and tools for transforming matter and energy from one state into another for specific goals. The first humans moved from 
the collection of tools to the first artifacts in stones, from those in stones to those in bronze, iron, and so on. The technical improvements were promoted by careful observation of the surrounding environment, trial and error processes, serendipity, which means fortuitous discoveries, and the formulation of inductive rules of thumb. Every breakthrough was presumably transmitted to children and peers, at first by grants and body language, and then by formulating spoken languages. The invention of languages promoted the development of social technologies, which are methods and tools for organizing people in pursuit of goals. Then even written languages were invented, and the solution of practical problems favored the birth of mathematics and geometry. With the birth of philosophical inquiry in ancient Greece, the philosophical period began. The original purpose of philosophy was to formulate and try to answer foundational questions regarding nature, the origin of everything, and the role of humanity in the universe. The method adopted for finding answers was etiological rationalism, based on free thinking. It means rigorous logical thinking, prone to search for the cause of everything and devoid of dogmas. This rigorous logical thinking was based on data mainly collected by the human senses, which are endosomatic tools because they are within our human body. It, uh, this rigorous logical thinking consisted mainly of inductions, deductions, and intuitions. For any causal event, we distinguish the causes, the effects, and the rules governing the phenomenon. Inductive reasoning finds the rule when causes and effects are known. Deductive reasoning finds the effects when the causes and the rules are known. Intuition is a sort of subconscious reasoning, only the final result of which becomes conscious. Intuitions might help find out the rules. Some philosophers propose answers which appear astonishing even nowadays. They are still valid in their essence. For, in for instance, Pythagoras and his disciples realized that the key to understanding nature is mathematics. Everything in the universe is harmony and number. A mathematical regularity exists everywhere. Empedocles and Anaxagoras formulated what is known today as the principles of mass conservation, stating that nothing's, nothing comes from nothing and nothing can be utterly destroyed. Democritus and Leucippus realized that everything is made of atoms. In the Middle Ages, philosophers such as the Arab Aladzen and the scholastic uh, Roger Bacon, William of Ockham, to cite just a few of them, prepared the ground for the formulation of the scientific method. They advocated the relevance of mathematics and the importance of experiments to interrogate nature. Finally, in the Renaissance, era, the polymath Leonardo da Vinci contributed uh, to the next scientific revolution by bringing mechanical arts requiring manual skills and liberal arts requiring mental skills to the same level of cultural dignity. The second revolutionary cultural event in the human journey to discovering the secrets of natural phenomena occurred in the scientific academies that blossomed in Italy during the 17th century and then spread to the rest of Europe. It was the mature formulation and application of the scientific method. Hence, the experimental period began. In the scientific academies, natural philosophers and artisans collaborated in performing experiments. Any experiment is a dialogue between nature from one side and natural philosophers and artisans on the other side. The experiment allows knowing if the formulated hypotheses and theories are correct or must be improved. Why did natural philosophers collaborate with artisans? Because artisans help design 
and implement instruments that are exosomatic tools used to establish the dialogue with nature. Such tools that are outside our body allow to extend the frontiers of human knowledge about nature, otherwise delimited by the investigating power of our senses. And the instruments allow to gain a more objective, reproducible, and universally valid responses from nature. The team made of natural philosophers and artisans were used to isolate, to purify the phenomenon under investigation. For instance, this picture shows that an inclined plane, almost devoid of friction, was used to determine the law of falling bodies. The isolation of the phenomenon under study allows to simplify its analysis and allows to guarantee more reproducible results by excluding random events as much as possible. Moreover, natural philosophers describe natural phenomena by using the universal language of mathematics and geometry. The work of Galileo Galilei at first and that of Isaac Newton, leader, laid the foundation of what is nowadays known as classical mechanics whose laws govern the physical behavior of macroscopic bodies moving at ordinary speeds. In his master masterpiece entitled Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica, Isaac Newton formulated the rules of reasoning in philosophy. Nowadays, we would say in science. Such rules originated the two relevant epistemological pillars, which are ideas guiding the interpretation of natural phenomena and the formulation of axioms. The first epistemological pillar is simplicity. Nature loves simplicity. The idea of a simple nature inspired the reductionist approach. Such an approach describes a natural system by decomposing it in its, into its constituents and studying their properties separately. Finally, the picture of the entire system can be reconstructed as a simple sum of the features of the elements. The second epistemological pillar is uniformity. Nature is uniform. The natural laws, which are valid here and now, are true everywhere and always in the universe. They are universal. And the universality is guaranteed by the existence of an absolute space and time reference system. The predictive power of classical mechanics and the consequent technological development promoted the formulation of two other epistemological pillars. One is mechanism. It sustains that everything in the universe, either inanimate or animate, behaves like a machine. Also vital phenomena like passion, memory, and imagination follow from the mirror arrangement of the machine's organs every bit as naturally as the movements of a clock or other automaton follow from the arrangement of its counterweights and wheels. As René Descartes stated in his Treatise on Man in 1664, all activities and qualities of bodies are reduced to quantitative realities, mass and motion. And from this idea, a picture of a universe hosting just a reversible transformation emerges. All motions are reversible and the experiments are reproducible. The other pillar is determinism. Determinism is well described by Pierre Simon de Laplace in his A Philosophical Assay on, probability, on Probabilities. We may regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its past and the cause of its future. These statements means that events are causal and the causality allows assuming that the reality is deterministic. Then Laplace added, an intellect which at a certain moment would know all forces, that's a natural emotion, and all position of all items of which nature is composed, if this intellect were also vast enough to submit this data to analysis, he would embrace in a single formula the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the tiniest atom. For such an intellect, nothing would be uncertain. 
and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. In other words, Laplace was advocating that if all the natural laws are deterministic were known, and if we could determine the position and momentum of every particle in the universe at a particular instant of time, we would be able to predict any subsequent event. The future is potentially predictable. Classical mechanics success in predicting the dynamics of macroscopic bodies generated an image of a clockwork universe that is understandable, predictable, and reversible. But scientific knowledge is in continuous evolution. Scientists collect data about natural phenomena by using instruments. And the sensitivity and resolution of the available fa facilities define the boundaries of what can be observed from what remains unexplored. From the investigation of the observable natural phenomena, just a few ingenious scientists can make inductive jumps and formulate axioms and postulates. Axiom and postulates are the fundamental principle, principles and laws of scientific knowledge. These are called theoreticians that use theorems and propositions from the axioms. The validity of theorems and hence implicitly of axioms must be proved by designing and performing suitable experiments. The theoretical prediction must be compared with the results of actual experiments. Experiments are carried out by those scientists we call experimentalists. The acquisition of new scientific knowledge usually promotes technological development. A new technology often allows extending the portion of the universe that is observable. New phenomena and features of the universe can pop up. Their interpretation often requires the formulation of new axioms through brand new inductive jumps. The novel axioms allow the deduction of new theorems and propositions that need to be experimentally confirmed. As seen before, the acquisition of new knowledge induces further technological development. More powerful technology extends our observational capabilities. New phenomena and features of the universe can emerge. They might require a new cycle of inductions, deductions, and experiments, and so on indefinitely. This is what occurred after the formulation of classical mechanics. In the 18th and 19th century AD, the Industrial Revolution faded the picture of a reversible universe. The entrepreneurs and scientists of that time try in any way to optimize the functioning of their thermally or electrically powered machines. And they clash with the impossibility of having machines with 100% efficiency and they could not avoid the degradation of part of mechanical or electrical energy into heat. The industrial processes, like most events in the universe we stumble across, are irreversible. Part of the work is inevitably squandered into heat. In the original scientific method proposed by Galilei and Newton and consisting in a purification, isolation of the empirical phenomena, before their interpretation and mathematical description, the irreversible feature of natural events was simply ignored. The interpretation of the phenomena of energy transformation generated a new theory called classical thermodynamics. Its second principle introduces a new state variable, entropy, and it asserts that the entropy of the universe increases relentlessly due to the irreversible processes. An increase in entropy means growth of disorder. After the formulation of, of thermodynamics, the epistemological pillar of mechanism was still maintained, but in a review form. It's still valid that the universe looks like a machine, but it works irreversibly in most cases due to frictions and other energy dissipation processes. The existence of irreversible events and an arrow of time in nature was corroborated by biology with the development of the theory of evolution. In the 18th century, paleontological evidence suggests that life on Earth comes from one form called Luca, the last universal common ancestor, which evolved in the myriad life forms we know nowadays. 
and how did it evolve? Well, since there's a frequently recurring struggle for existence, it follows that any being, if it varies, however slightly, in any manner profitable to itself, under the complex and sometimes varying conditions of life, will have a better chance of surviving and thus be naturally selected. From the strong principle of inheritance, any selected variety will tend to propagate its new and modified form, as stated by Charles Darwin in his famous book on the origin of species. Evolutionary processes governed by natural selections have given rise to the, di the diversity of species. Life on Earth has its history. The simple early forms transform in more very beautiful and marvelous ones along the millennia. In the first half of the 20th century, the recent discoveries and technologies in the field of electromagnetism favored the formulation of two new remarkable scientific theories. The first was relativity theory, formulated by Albert Einstein. He describes the behavior of bodies moving at very high speed, close to that of light. And according to the relativity theory, the space and time coordinates depend on the velocity and the strength of the gravitational field in which the reference system is embedded. They are not static, they are elastic uh, coordinates. The epistemological pillar of universality was permanently weakened with respect to the power it had before. The features of space and time are context dependent. A universal space-time reference system doesn't exist the second remarkable scientific theory formulated in the first half of the 20th century was quantum mechanics. It describes the behavior of microscopic bodies, such as molecules, atoms, and subatomic particles, moving at ordinary speeds. Its foundations were established by many scientists. Some of them are shown in this picture. And among the principles of quantum mechanics, the uncertainty principle formulated by Heisenberg is particularly relevant for our story. He declares that it's impossible to determine accurately and simultaneously two properties of a microscopic particles, such as its position and momentum, which are necessary to predict the dynamics of particles. This principle struck a hard blow to the epistemological pillar of determinism and predictability. The Laplace dream of predicting the future through the laws of physics and the determination of the instantaneous state of all particles in the universe was shattered irreparably. In the natural world, the microscopic particles normally remain in an uncertain, non-deterministic dark path, and their evolution can be predicted just in probabilistic terms. The dream of predicting natural phenomena was shattered even slightly earlier at the end of the 19th century and for macroscopic bodies by Henri Poincaré. He found out that a system as simple as that constituted by three orbiting planets exhibits a dynamic that is aperiodic and extremely sensitive to the initial conditions. In essence, Poincaré was the first to experience deterministic chaos. The determination of the initial conditions for any system is tainted by unavoidable errors and uncertainties. In fact, science is said to be exact, not because it's based on infinitely exact data, but because its rigorous methodologies allows determining the extent of uncertainty associated with any determination. The consequence is that any chaotic dynamic is unpredictable in the long term by definition. The first half of the 20th century was clearly dramatic for natural sciences, but it was dramatic also for mathematics. In the year 1900, at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Paris, the German mathematician David Hilbert made a list of unsolved problems in mathematics. The most important ones were those regarding mathematics itself and what can be proved using mathematics. They can be summarized in three fundamental questions. Is mathematics complete? 
mathematics is complete if every mathematical statement can be proved or disproved from a given finite set of axioms. Is mathematics consistent? Mathematics is consistent if only the true statements can be proved. Is every statement in mathematics decidable? Every statement in mathematics is decidable if a definite procedure tells us whether a statement is true or false in finite time. Until 1930, the three fundamental questions remain unanswered. But Hibbert was confident that the answers would be three yes. With great surprise, in 1931, the 25 year old Kurgudel presented a proof of the so called incompleteness theorem. This theorem states that if mathematics is consistent, then it's incomplete. And there are true statements that cannot be proved. If it were inconsistent, then there would be false statements that could be proved. And the entire building of mathematics would crash down. Therefore, the answer to the, the question uh, is mathematics consistent is yes, but the answer to the first question is mathematics complete is unfortunately no. But the surprises had not ended here. In fact, in 1935, the 23-year-old Alan Turing demonstrated that the answer to the third question is no again. Turing demonstrated that all possible mathematical problems can be partitioned into two sets. One set contains all those problems for which algorithms can never be written, they are unsolvable. And the other set includes all those problems that can be solved by algorithms. Some of the solvable problems are tractable, some others are intractable because they cannot be solved accurately and in a reasonable time. We will talk more about intractability later in this lecture. Just as quantum mechanics and chaos theory shattered the Laplace dream of a science with an unlimited predictive power, the Gödel's incompleteness theorem, and the Turing's results shattered the Hilbert's dream of a mathematics with an unlimited computing power. Briefly, based on what I have told you so far, it's evident that almost all the original epistemological pillar established after the formulation of classical mechanics were revisited by new discoveries and the formulation of new scientific theories. In particular, the pillar sustaining mechanism and reversibility was transformed by formulating classical thermodynamics and the theory of biological evolution. The pillar of determinism and predictability was weakened by quantum mechanics and chaos theory. The theory of relativity downsized the pillar of uniformity and universality. Based on what I said so far, the only pillar that was still standing was the pillar advocating that nature is simple and it's correct to use the reductionist approach for investigating nature. Actually, at the end of the 19th century, Box, Boltzmann, Maxwell, and Gibbs try to understand the microscopic origin of the second principle of thermodynamics. They face problems involving a massive number of variables, an Avogadro's number of variables, which are all the particles, position, and velocities. They abandon problems of simplicity, characterized by a few variables, and focus on problems of disorganized complexity, because these particles move randomly. And to deal with the disorganized complexity, they turn to the laws of statistics and probability. They are certain that the final disorder so state of uh, an irreversible transformation involving an isolated system is the most probable macroscopic state because it's associated with the largest number of microscopic states. During the 20th century, other amazing, amazing discoveries moved the focus of scientific inquiry far from simplicity. I mentioned just a few of them. At the beginning of the 20th century, Lotke Volterra formulated a model for the predator and prey relationship in any ecosystem. And they found the abundance of the two populations self-organizes in time because they oscillate periodically. 
1952, in his seminal paper entitled The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis, Alan Turing developed a reaction diffusion model to interpret phenomena of spontaneous spatial self-organizations, such as the development of an embryo, phylotaxis, and the formation of animal markings. In 1950s and 1960s, the two Russian chemists, Boris Belusov and Anatol Zabotisky, discovered the power of inanimate matter to self-organize in time and space and give rise to oscillatory chemical reactions and chemical waves. These phenomena also became evident in biology. Suffice to think about the circadian rhythms in our body, which are examples of periodic processes. And suffice to think about the propagation of an action potential along the axon of a neuron. This is, that is an example of an electrochemical wave generated by the activities of sodium and potassium channels along the axon's membrane. So a spontaneous question arose, if the second law of thermodynamics is true, advocating that any irreversible transformation determines a growth of disorder, how is it possible to observe the spontaneous emergence of order in time and space? Well, the answer came from the theory of auto of equilibrium thermodynamics developed by the chemist Ilya Prigogine in the 1960s and 1970s. When a closed and unopened system is maintained far from equilibrium, the thermodynamic equilibrium, by forces which are uh, gradients of intensive variables, then it can give rise to phenomena of temporal and spatial self-organizations. This system does not, does not violate the second law of thermodynamics, but it maintains order within it by discharging entropy in the surrounding environment. Such a kind of system has been named dissipative structure. Another big step in the 20th century was the design and implementation of the first electronic computers, thanks to John von Neumann and Alan Turing's contributions. The architecture of the device is still in use, although the performances of the electronic computers have been improved by introducing transistors and through their relentless miniaturization. Electronic computers became and are still valuable tools to process data and to perform computational experiments. For instance, in 1960s, meteorologist Eduardo Lorenz formulated a simplified model of the dynamics of the terrestrial atmosphere to make weather forecasts. And he described the dynamic of the terrestrial atmosphere by a system of three nonlinear differential equations and rediscovered deterministic chaos. By serendipity, Lorentz discovered that the dynamical behavior of its, of its model would soon become utterly different if he started his simulations from slightly different initial conditions. This result implies that the weather is intrinsically unpredictable. Tiny uncertainties to the, in defining the initial conditions of the atmosphere are amplified rapidly, eventually leading to embarrassing forecasts. The term butterfly effect was kind to refer to this idea of sensitive dependence on the initial conditions for the dynamics of nonlinear chaotic system. A flap of butterfly wings in Brazil can trigger a tornado in Texas. The use of always more powerful computers allow Robert May to develop a model for the dynamics of a population in the presence of different amounts of food. He used these iterative nonlinear equations called logistic map, where Xn represent the relative abundance of the population at the end generation, Xn plus one is the relative abundance at the next generation. And the parameter R is proportional to the amount of food which is available. The dynamics of the population is sensitive to the R value. When R is small, the population extinguishes. For slightly bigger R value, the population reaches a steady state solution. The bigger R value, the larger the population abundance. Above a threshold value, the population starts to oscillate first between two values, 
Then between four values, eight, 16, 32, 64, and so on, until reaching an infinite number of possible values, which means chaos. Then the oscillatory regime might reappear. And finally, chaos again. It was possible to build the so-called bifurcation diagram of the logistic map by employing the computer. It reports all the possible solutions for the relative abundance of the population as a function of the parameter R. The computer allowed to discover an astonishing property of this iconic bifurcation diagram. The bifurcation diagram is self-similar. By zooming in it, we find the entire structure of the diagram at the smaller and smaller scales. This diagram is a fractal. A fractal is a self-similar structure whose dimensions is not necessarily an integer number, like for the objects of the Euclidean geometry. A strong supporter of the importance of fractal geometry in nature was the mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot, who, armed with a powerful computer, created fantastic fractals and show that many natural objects are fractal-like structures because they are self-similar, at least within a certain range of special scales. Examples of natural-like, natural fractal-like structures are ferns, broccolis, branches of trees, and the outlet of rivers. Furthermore, it was found out that chaos in time originate, originates fractal structures, as it is in the case of the logistic map. The scientific investigation into the dynamics of biological population, trophic relationships and ecosystems, embryos development, circadian rhythms, oscillatory chemical reactions, chemical waves, climate, and so on, shifted the focus of the scientific research to the so-called organized complexity. The observation that system as diverse as all the biological species, natural ecosystems, human societies, world economy, climate, share some features, triggered the birth of a new interdisciplinary science known as complexity science. According to complexity science, all the systems shown in these slides are instances of complex systems. Although they appear quite diverse, they share at least three features. First, all complex systems can be described as networks whose constitutive parts are nodes and links. The nodes represent the network elements, whereas the links are the connections between them. For instance, in a cell, the nodes are the chemical compounds and the links are the chemical reactions. In our brain, the nodes are the neurons, whereas the links are the connections among synapses and dendrites. Alternatively, in an ecosystem, the nodes are the biological species, whereas the links are the symbiotic and trophic relationships among them. Different complex systems have distinct networks architectures. For most complex systems, nodes and links are diverse and their behavior might be variable. Moreover, relationships are mutual. There are numerous feedback actions and networks are characterized by high degrees of nonlinearity. Secondly, complex systems are out of equilibrium in the thermodynamic sense. If a complex system involves just inanimate matter, its behavior is driven by force fields. If a complex system includes living beings, its behavior also depends on the living being's power of use to use matter and energy to encode, collect, store, and process, and send information to pursue their goals. Third, thirdly, complex systems exhibit emergent properties. A property is emergent when it belongs to the network as a whole. It cannot be attributed to a few nodes and links, but to the entire collection of nodes and relationships. Examples of emergent properties are the phenomena of temporal and spatial self-organizations and deterministic chaos that we mentioned before. These emergent properties can be understood and sometimes predicted by using the principle of nonlinear dynamics. 
but there are emerging properties that are not fully understood and cannot be predicted. The phenomenon of life is an example. Life has many peculiar attributes. However, we don't know its origin. We cannot obtain life from scratch, from its molecular constituents, and we cannot predict the evolution of its forms. Why are there emerging properties that are not understood and cannot be predicted yet? Well, there are at least three primary reasons which outline an epistemological complexity. The first reason is due to descript descriptive complexity. Often we encounter unsurmountable difficulties in describing complex systems by using a reductionist approach because complex systems usually consist of many nodes, which might be diverse and variable in their behavior, many links, which might be diverse and variable in time, and all these features might be sensitive uh, to the context. In other words, some emergent properties of complex systems are variable patterns. Variable patterns are entities or events whose recognition is made difficult by their multiple features, variability, and extreme sensitivity to the context. Examples of variable patterns are biological species, patterns and symptoms in medical diagnosis, patterns in apparently uncorrelated experimental data, a periodic time series, political, social, and economic events. It's necessary to formulate algorithms to recognize every type of pattern, whatever their context is. And the steps of pattern recognitions are data acquisition by instruments, selection of the representative features, and application of an algorithm for the classification step. The research line of pattern recognitions is particularly flourishing. Nevertheless, we still need to formulate universally valid and effective algorithms for the recognition of every type of pattern. The epistemological complexity is also linked to computational complexity. Uh, many computational problems regarding complex systems are solvable but intractable. Examples are scheduling, machine learning, solving the Schrodinger equation, the protein folding problem, the travel incensement problem, and so on and so forth. Their intractability is understandable if we consider the theory of computational complexity. All the solvable problems can be partitioned into two groups. The group of polynomial problems. The problem is, is a polynomial. When the number of computational steps needed to solve that problem is a polynomial function of the dimensions of the problem. The polynomial problems are problems of recognitions and they are tractable because we can determine their exact solutions, whatever is the dimensions of the problem. But unfortunately, we have also exponential problems. The problem is exponential when the number of computational steps is an exponential function of the dimensions of the problem. Unfortunately, large exponential problems are intractable. We cannot determine their exact solutions in a reasonable time interval. Let's make an example. Let's think about the Schrodinger equation that we use to determine the energy of a system described at the molecular level. The number of computational steps needed to solve this equation grows exponentially with the number of particles. When we have a system with just 500 particles, I say just because a macroscopic system consists of an Avogadro's number of particles usually, the number of computational steps for a system with just 500 particles is so large, so huge, uh, to the tune of 10 to 150, that even if we have the fastest supercomputer in the world to make this kind of computation. And nowadays, the fastest supercomputer in the world is the American frontier, reaching the astonishing computational rate of 1,100 petaflop per second. One petaflop is 10 to 15 floating point operation per second. Even with the American frontier, the time required to solve accurately the Schrodinger equation for a system with just 500 particles is so long to the tune of 10 to 125 years that is unreasonable. Suffice to think that the age of the universe has been estimated to be 40 billion years. So clearly, in these cases, we must abandon the idea of finding the exact solutions 
our large exponential problems, if the only possible algorithm is that of brute force. Therefore, we are forced to transform the original exponential problems in problems of recognizing acceptable solutions generated non-deterministically and in a reasonable time interval. In other words, we, the exponential problems are transformed into non-deterministic polynomial problems or NP problems. And within the set of the NP problems, there's a subset called NP complete. It contains problems such as the Schrodinger equation, the traveling sentiment problem, the protein folding problem. And this subset embodies the secret of computational intractability. Since a polynomial time algorithm for one of them would immediately imply the tractability of all problems in NP. The Klein Mathematics Institute declared the P versus NP as one of its millennium problems. And it offers $1 million to anyone who provides a verified proof that either the NP problems are reducible to polynomial problems or this reduction is impossible. If the relation NP is equal to P were demonstrated to be true, then as the same Gödel said in a letter to von Neumann in 1956, that discovery would have consequences of the greatest magnitude. Our life would not be the same. Everything would be much more efficient. The transportation schedules of all farms would be optimized, allowing people and goods to move quicker and cheaper. Manufacturers and business persons would improve their production processes and increase profits. It would become much easier to find effective treatments for incurable diseases, make reliable weather forecasts for longer periods of time, predict catastrophic events and the trends of stock markets. But even if one day someone demonstrated that all the exponential problems are reducible to polynomial problems, and universally valid and effective algorithms were formulated to recognize variable patterns, certain limitation in predictive power of science would remain. As far as the microscopic world is concerned, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle holds. So we might think of limiting the description of complex systems at the macroscopic scale, neglect neglecting their microscopic constituents. However, Complex systems can exhibit chaotic dynamics, and chaotic dynamics are unperiodic and extremely sensitive to the initial conditions. Since the determination of the initial conditions are always affected by uncertainties and errors, it derives that chaotic dynamics are unpredictable in the long term by definition. It derives that when we study complex systems, we cannot trust in a cornerstone of the original scientific method which is the reproducibility of our experiments. Often, experiments regarding complex systems are historical events. In this regard, the image that the philosopher Karl Popper proposed in his essay entitled Of Clouds and Clocks is particularly effective. In the past, science had been occupied with clocks, which are simple, deterministic systems having reproducible behaviors. Now instead, science has to deal with clouds, which are complex systems, having unique and hardly replicable behaviors. In summary, the reason we find unsurmountable difficulties in describing and predicting the behavior of complex systems are descriptive complexity, computational complexity, and the intrinsic limitation of the predictive power of science. Being aware of these limitations that define an epistemological complexity, how can we face and win the global challenges of this center? I propose some strategies. First, we need interdisciplinary approaches in research and teaching. The formation of truly interdisciplinary research group should be supported by public and private funding. It's urgent to propose interdisciplinary courses on complex systems teach the theories with, which, which have some transdisciplinary features, breaking down the traditional disciplinary boundaries. And we need to present the properties of complex systems. For instance, at my university, 
I, pro I propose such kind of course to graduate students in chemistry and graduate students in biotechnology. And of course, I use my tech, my book as a textbook for these courses. I present the features of complex systems by using uh, an interdisciplinary approach, by making examples from chemistry, physics, biology, ecology, economy, and philosophy. And I present their features mainly by using uh, the principles of out of equilibrium thermodynamics and nonlinear dynamics. I'm also participating in an European uh, project of strategic partnership Erasmus Plus, whose aim is to enhance higher education on complex system thinking for sustainable development. Second, the description of complex system as networks must be carried out by using not only the reductionist approach, which focuses on the single nodes and links, often it's inappropriate, but also the systemic approach, which focuses on the entire network and the mesoscopic approach, which focuses on clusters of nodes. Since the behavior of complex system is highly dynamic, it's necessary to monitor them continuously by collecting, storing, and processing a massive data sets, the so-called big data. Furthermore, it's becoming evident that an alternative way for doing experiments on complex systems is to perform simulations in computers. And for these two last reasons, it's necessary to speed up our computational machines, extend their memory space, and contrive more effective algorithms. I think there are two relevant strategies to succeed in reaching this fifth goal. One, the first strategy consists in improving current electronic computers that are based on the von Neumann architecture. The pace of their improvement uh, uh, is, is, uh, is described by the Moore's law, has been described by the Moore's law in the last uh, 50 years or so. And this law states that the number of transistors per chip doubles every two years. By increasing the number of transistors per chip, the number of computational steps that can be performed at the same cost grows. However, Moore's law will stop holding sooner or later because transistors will be made of a few atoms and chips producers invest billions of dollars in contriving computing technologies that can go beyond Moore's law. The second strategy is the interdisciplinary research line of natural computing. Researchers working on natural computing draw inspiration from natural phenomena to propose new algorithms, new materials and architectures to compute, and new methods and models to understand complex systems. Natural computing is based on the rationale that any distinguishable physical chemical state of matter and energy can be used to encode information. And every natural transformation of these states is a kind of computation. Within natural computing, there are two important research programs. In the first research program, scientists exploit the physical chemical laws to make computations. Every physical chemical law describes a causal event, and any causal event can be conceived as a computation. In fact, the causes are the inputs, the effects are the outputs, and the law governing the transformation is the algorithm of the computation. The second research program on natural computing mimics the features of the natural information system that belong to living beings. We might mimic how the cells compute or otherwise how the nervous system, the immune systems and their societies compute. Currently, my attention is focused on the human nervous system. Human intelligence, that might be conceived as the emergent property of the human nervous system is valuable when we face complex scenarios. It allows us to handle both accurate and vague information computing with numbers and words. It allows to reason, speak, and make rational decisions in an environment of uncertainty, partiality, and relativity of truth. When the incompatibility principle holds, as the complexity of a system increases, accuracy and significance become almost mutually exclusive characteristics of our statements. Finally, our intelligence allows us to recognize quite easily variable patterns. Therefore, 
It's worthwhile studying human intelligence and trying to reproduce it by developing artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the interdisciplinary research line aiming to devise intelligent machines. Some intelligent machines only compute and make decisions, but others can also act on their environment after taking their decisions. The latter machines are called robots. Computing machines assist humans in their mental labor. Robots are meant to help humans in our mental and manual efforts. If properly designed, such intelligent machines can replace humans for accomplishing specific tasks. Sometimes they can even go beyond human performances. And since machines are becoming more and more intelligent, artificial intelligence has been exerting a soaring impact on our societies. Artificial intelligence is traditionally developed through two strategies. One relies on current electronic computers or special purpose hardware and develops human-like intelligent software. Such software either reproduces the thinking process when it is a flow of rigorous logical operations or mimics some structural and functional features of neural networks to learn how to perform tasks from data. The other strategy to develop AI is neuromorphic engineering. It implements surrogates on neurons through non-biological systems, either for neuroprosthesis or to design brain-like computing machines, revolutionizing the von Neumann's architecture. More recently, a new strategy to mimic human intelligence has been put forward. It's the so-called chemical artificial intelligence. Chemical artificial intelligence is the interdisciplinary research line that uses molecular, supramolecular, and system chemistry to mimic some performances of human intelligence. And there are two strategies for its development. One consists in devising chemical computing systems that process either quantum or binary or fuzzy logic. The second consists in devising modules of chemical robots. A chemical robot is a molecular assembly, a confined molecular assembly, that reacts autonomously to its environment because it has sensors that collect data about the environment. It has artificial neural networks to make, to process this information, this data, make decisions and trigger the action of molecular effectors that can act upon the environment. The intelligent activities of a chemical robot should be sustained energetically by a metabolic unit. Chemical robots should be easily miniaturized and implanted in living beings to interplay with cells or organelles for biomedical applications. They should become auxiliary elements of our immune system. To succeed in our project, we follow a methodology that has been declared effective for dealing with any complex system by the cognitive scientist Gally Stephen King and the neuroscientist Mark. Such a methodology requires an analysis of a complex system at three levels. The first is the analysis at the computational level. It consists in describing the inputs, outputs, and the computation the system performs. The second is the analysis at the algorithmic level. that consists in formulating algorithms that might carry out those computations. And finally, an analysis at the implementation level that consists in looking for mechanisms that implement those algorithms. Based on what I told you today, it's now evident and what I say in my book, it's now evident why I proclaim they were probably entering a new stage in the human journey to discovering the secrets of nature. This new period will be presumably called computational, not because we will abandon the laboratory experiments and we will perform experiments only through the computer. This is not true, but rather because the natural computing rational which assumes that every natural transformation is a kind of computation, will help us to face complexity from both an ontological and an epistemological point of view. We still need to work hard before untangling complex systems. It's a grand challenge for science, but as the same Einstein declared, we must learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow. The important thing is not to stop questioning. Thank you for your attention and I hope you will enjoy reading my book.